When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Hey, I'm Travis Kelsey, and I'm here to tell you that you can get every touchdown from every game on Sunday afternoons with NFL Red Zone from NFL Network, included in Sports Pack on DirecTV, so you'll never miss a big moment. Hey, we kind of shared a big moment learning about all this great football on DirecTV, didn't we? I know I'll never forget it. Stop compromising. Get DirecTV with or without a satellite when you visit DirecTV.com. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that will not steal your identity, but he will steal your heart. Ladies and, well, gentlemen, beware, for he is the captain. I am a man who loves all people. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Identity Crisis by one of my favorite brewing companies, Mad Tree, garage mm-hmm. grade four out of five bottle caps. This is a black IPA, a dark ale with the backbone of a porter, but the earthy, citrusy hops typical in many IPAs. This unique ale will have you questioning its identity and maybe yours as well. And today's beer was brought to us by our good garage friends. First up, we have Stephen in Aberdeenshire. United Kingdom. And a big we like your jib to Matthew in Knoxville, Tennessee. Next, we have Susan in Lake Monmara, Australia. And another from the land down under, we have Kate from Melbourne, Australia. And here's a cheers to Daniel in Carlsberg, Pennsylvania. And last but not least, we have Lindsay in Montvale, New Jersey, who says when she's listening, she feels like myself and the captain are her best buds. Hashtag best jibs. Uh, Okay. Hashtag BFF TCG forever. Hashtag thanks for the beer money. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and there's a little button on there that says donate. Just click on that. If you'd like to help out the show, but you want to get something in return, check out the store page at truecrimegarage.com and follow us on all social media at True Crime Garage. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Lee Henson is classified as an endangered missing person and has been missing since July 4th, 1999. She was last seen by her family and friends in her hometown of Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Brooke was born in 1979. At the time of her disappearance, Brooke was 20 years old. She is a Caucasian female and is described as 5 foot 4 inches tall, 104 pounds. Henson has blonde hair and brown eyes. Her ears are pierced, and at the time of her disappearance, her hair was dyed brown. 
Brooke Henson smoked Marlboro cigarettes, and typically she did not wear makeup. Her nickname is Brookie. When last seen, Brooke was wearing a tan tank top and dark green shorts. She wore black sandals, a silver watch on her left wrist, and a silver bracelet on her right wrist. The circumstances of her disappearance is this. It was 1999 in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Brooke Lee Henson, 20 years old, lived with her family. On July 3rd, Brooke hosted a party with several friends during the evening hours. People were coming and going from the Henson home. Early the next day, at 2 a.m. on the 4th of July, Brooke's parents returned home. They had been out of town, having gone to a concert in Charlotte, North Carolina. When the exhausted parents arrived home, they found Brooke sitting on the front porch of their home. She too looked tired, but mostly looked upset. Brooke told her parents that she and her boyfriend Sean had a disagreement earlier that night. This was not an uncommon occurrence. Brooke and Sean regularly disagreed and regularly got into verbal altercations. She told her parents that she was going to take a walk down to Willis's store on the corner of Hawkins Road and Poinsett Highway. She smoked Marlboros, and she needed to buy a pack of cigarettes. At approximately 2.20 a.m., Brooke Lee Henson left her home. She was last seen walking along Henderson Drive, making her way to the store, wearing a tan tank top and dark green shorts. The store is about two blocks from her home, She reportedly left a note to her boyfriend that read, Follow me if you care. Brooke Henson never returned home. Her family would never hear from her again. Then, in 2004, someone using the name Brooke Henson took out a student loan and enrolled at Columbia University in New York City. Esther Elizabeth Reed was born in 1978 in the tiny town of Townsend, Montana, and she was the youngest of nine children. Esther's parents are Ernest and Florence Reed. Her parents separated in the early 1990s, and when this happened, Esther, she moved with her mother to the Seattle, Washington area. Esther dropped out of high school in 1995 and three years later in 1998 sadly her mother Florence died of cancer after the passing of her mother Esther Reed started to get into trouble she stole a purse and she was using items in the stolen purse for her own you know whatever she wanted to do with them Mm -hmm. this was a debit or credit card and a checkbook so basically stealing money In October of 1999, she pled guilty to possession of stolen property, and shortly after, Esther Reed disappeared. So, Captain, she's a young adult at this time. She's over the age of 18, and she takes off. And she's she's out on her own. She's able to do that. She has the freedom to do so. But Mm -hmm. while she is missing, while her family thinks that she is missing, you showed me this great article the other day that showed that there was some thought that she might have been a victim of the Green River Killer who was still unknown at that time and running amok in the Seattle area who was killing working girls and runaways. Yeah, so there was a a victim that they weren't able to identify and instantly they thought, well, this is probably this Esther Reed that has went missing from Seattle. There was some resemblance between the uh, body that was found in Esther Reed. Uh, Well, she was not a victim of the Green River Killer. In fact, she was alive and she was well. Mm -hmm. Um, She was, rather than missing, we should say she was on the run would be more uh, appropriate, I believe. Right. So while she's on the... Who's she on the run from? (laughs) uh, I don't know. It, It seems weird. She had some... She had some troubles in Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. It also sounds like she was a bit estranged from her family as well. Maybe on the run from everyone. Um, And I would also include maybe herself, the real Esther Reed. Now, while she is missing, 
she would assume the identities of other people. And she often told friends that she supported herself as a professional chess player, winning tournaments for money. One of the first aliases that Esther Reed used was Natalie Fisher. And I'm not certain of what crimes were committed or why she or how she obtained the name and identity of Natalie Fisher, but something would make her change that because in 2001, well, hold on. I wonder if she used the, the name Natalie Fisher because of Bobby Fisher, the chess player. That's interesting. I never put that mm. together, but in 2001, she changed her name again. This mm. time Reed assumed the identity of one Natalie Bowman. She's going to use this identity to enroll into California state university. And she fits in as a college student. No one had any reason to believe that this Natalie Bowman was anyone else or wasn't who she said she was. Mm, Yeah, because most of the time when people go on the run, they don't enroll into college. Right. Well, while attending this college, Esther Reed posing as this Natalie Bowman, she joined the school's debate team. Uh, She, with her team, competed in several tournaments. Then she was admitted to Harvard University. This is after having reaching, she reached out to one of the real Natalie Bowman's former professors. She got this teacher who was in South America at the time to write a letter of recommendation, which then helped her to get into Harvard University. Mm -hmm. But again, something must have happened here, Captain, because we see a shift one more time. And this would be in 2003, Esther Reed started using the identity of Brooke Henson, the missing young woman from Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Well, I think she started using this name or she came up with this idea because when she went to transfer, when she went to get into this next school, she actually had to use some of the professors from Cal State um, to give her recommendations. But she had to explain to them, hey, you can't use this name. I need you to use this other name. You can't use Natalie Bowman's name. I need you to use this other name. Why? Her excuse to these professors was, well, I'm being stalked by an ex-boyfriend, and I don't want him to find out. Now (laughs) that I'm leaving town, I'm going to another college on the other side of the country. This is my escape plan, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to better myself after the escape. I can't let him chase me there. Right, but these are college professors. I mean, so don't don't be such a dummy. You know what I mean? A co- a college girl comes to you. She has this story about why she's going to be using a different name. That's a red flag right there. You should not be going along with this. You should not be writing recommendations for somebody with a fictitious name. You do not know what she's going to use that recommendation for. It, there could be a real person out there with that name. I, so it, it it baffles me uh, that these professors and and I'm just going to speculate that I wonder if there was a more in depth relationship between her and this professor for him to go ahead and use his name to you know I mean basically it's it's uh, it's fraud could have been there could have been or he might have caught on to her plan or 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 thought something fishy was going on because we do see her then change her identity one more time. So maybe she thought that, that you know, they were on to her, that somebody had figured out what was going on. It, it was in 2003 that she started using this identity of Brooke Henson. Mm-hmm. And it's believed that she found Brooke Henson's story on the internet. You know, she's a missing woman. The two were roughly the same age. So I'm guessing Reed figures this is, you know, this is an easy one to to pull off because we're going to look about the same age. They right. don't look anything alike, but Reed figures out how to obtain the missing woman's social security number. And along with this, she's using Brooke's name, birthday, and other information. She receives her, her GED or a GED for Brooke Henson. Right. So using this new identity, she takes the SAT scoring a 1400. And with her new credentials, she applies to Columbia University. What did you score on yours? I scored a 2,600. (laughs) You didn't even take the SATs. 2,600. Um, (laughs) So she is at this very prestigious college for quite some time. 
Yeah. She's fitting in there. She is um, getting good grades, maintaining good grades. She was majoring in psychology, I believe, and taking some criminal justice classes, type classes. Uh, and she was getting, I think, a 3.2 GPA. Yeah, so she's doing really well. But also, at the same time, she's taking out student loans. She's, I think, applying for credit cards. So what's happening is we're getting some hits on Brooke Henson, the missing girl. We're getting some hits on her actual Social Security number. Yeah, and she she took out over $100,000 in student loans. She ran up credit card debt. And and I couldn't find like a number on the credit card debt. I couldn't either. Um, they were they were not outright with that. Right. But here's the other thing, though, Captain. It, it's possible that she might have been using more than one identity at a time. But yeah, yeah. You know, so during this time, she's racking up debt for Brooke Henson, but at the same time, she could be racking up debt under fictitious names or other real people's names. Right. During this time, too, she she even obtained a passport, which is not an easy thing to do. I tell you what, I have I have a passport. You have a passport. Mm-hmm. And people out there with passports know even when you are who you say you are, even mm-hmm. when you have your real information, it's still not easy to get a passport. So I think um, it's amazing to me she was able to forge this passport deal. But also during this time, Captain, she's on several dating sites. Um I don't know which ones. I think eHarmony and, and, yeah, and one of the other ones. Match.com. Yeah. So note to self, never sign up for Match.com or sign up for eHarmony. Because <laughs> there's people out there that are using people's fake fake names. There's people out there with fake names trying to, to con you out of your catfish money. Catfish you. Yeah, they're going to catfish your ass. So, but she's also dating guys from uh, West Point at the, mm-hmm. during her time in college. Yeah, multiple guys from West Point. In 2006, Esther Reed, using the name Brooke Henson, was seeking employment. She applies for a job, and, well, the person in charge of hiring did an Internet search of the name on the application, this being, of course, Brooke Henson's name. Mm -hmm. This woman finds a website, a missing persons site, which revealed that Brooke Henson was, in fact, a missing person from South Carolina. So the police in South Carolina are contacted and they then alert the New York City police. Now let's go through this a little bit, Captain, because the way that this goes down is this woman who is, she's flipping through her applications, looking for somebody to hire, decides she's going to do a little quick internet search. We've, some of us have been there before, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, I was doing one, I think last year, well, maybe two years ago now. I did like a quick Facebook search of a few different applicants that we had. And one of them, the guy was like smoking a joint on his Facebook page. So you're <laughs> like, you're like, uh, you know, eh, nothing wrong with it, but you know, you, you might not want to hire that guy. I mean, you, you might want to hang out with that guy on the weekend, but you might not want to hire him for a job. Right. Right. Uh, if he's, well, if he's so brilliant that he puts that picture on Facebook, right. what other brilliant feats is, is he, uh, capable of? So, um, she finds this, that this person, this applicant name is a missing person. And on the website, there's a picture of Brooke Henson Yeah, and she's going, wait a second. I'm sure her first thought was probably I've located a missing person. And then she sees the picture and she's like, wait a second. These two do not look like one another. The person that came in and applied for a job does not look like the person that I'm seeing on this website. Well, it's interesting to me because you'd also think that maybe the person would think, well, this is just a different, right. You know, Brooke Henson. Right. That, but they share the same birth date. I think yeah. I think there's probably enough red flags that, that went up. I don't know what information she would have put on that application. Yeah, that's true. Um, so anyway, what she does is she contacts the the local police where this Brooke Henson went missing from, mm-hmm. and they get in contact with the family with with Brooke Henson's family. And this to me, this is the sad part of the case. Extremely sad. We have this young woman who goes missing. She's 20 years old at the time that she goes missing. She would have been gone for what? About seven years. 
by this time. Yeah. So the family, I would imagine most of the leads dried up a long time ago before this pops up seven years later. Yeah, basically at this point, you know, the case was cold and there was no new leads, no new information for a long time. So the fact that now they're getting this call, now they're getting law enforcement involved and law enforcement just look into it initially is like, well, now we have all these hits on her social security, you know, number. So is it possible that she's alive and just starting a new life? Right. That she walked away on her own and now she's attending college up, up North. Well, what they do is the New York city police get involved as well. And they're talking to this person claiming to be Brooke Henson. And in fact, Esther Reed sticks to her guns and says, I am Brooke Henson and I did leave on my own. I didn't want to live there anymore. I decided to move out of state. I'm up here in New York city, bettering my life, going to college and no, I don't want any contact with my family. Right. But it's like uh, George Costanza. He says, you know, it's only a lie if you believe it's a lie. Yeah. Well then the police have to, here, here's the issue. Okay. It's a, it's a strange boat to be in, mm-hmm. but now they have to either prove this person isn't who she says she is, or the person has to prove she is who she says she is. Right. And so they get some questions from the family. I believe it was the aunt came up with a bunch of a list of questions and said, Hey, ask her this stuff. And here's the answers to it, but see how many of these she gets right. Yeah, but it's like weird stuff like what's your uncle's uh, nickname? Stuff like that. Like, yeah, and who's your brother's best friend? It, it's it's things that are a little complicated in in my opinion. These are these are questions that I think you would have to not only have you'd have to be the person. You would have to well, you, right. and you would have to have life experiences as this person in that specific family. Right. But the crazy thing is she gets submitted this list of questions and they come back and say, well, she got a lot of them, right? She got a lot of, not all of them, but she got a lot of them, right? I wonder if she used some kind of, uh, conversation psychology where she was, you know, kind of manipulating the situation of the conversation with the police officers to get the right answers or to get it. So they believed that she was correct. I, th- I think you're probably onto something there. We What we have to keep in mind here is, one, she's not a mind reader. And, and two, she's... She, well, we don't know that for sure. But she is a con artist. Right. And not only a con artist, but someone that has trained and schooled herself for many years doing this. Mm-hmm. She, by this point, she's assumed, she's taken on at least three identities that we know of. She's also... Before she was stealing identities, she was stealing things like credit cards, checkbooks, right? You know, so in a form, that's another form of stealing someone's identity. You're just not saying that you're just going off of, trust me, I'm this person with this credit card. I'm this person with this checkbook. So she's probably found herself throughout the years in many conversations with many different people, mm -hmm. not law enforcement. But people that are saying, hey, you know, like me and you hanging out right now, if I started dropping you questions and we just met each other six months ago, she's learning how to lie to different people and and get through. There's probably been many awkward or uncomfortable situations that she's found herself in. Just the people around her at that time don't realize that she's lying to all. Well, and probably her demeanor as well. She's also good at, you know being under that stress and under that heat of people asking questions and she's kind of, you know, used to this. So she's just going to act like no, no big deal. So then law enforcement's going to go, well, based off her body language, based off her demeanor, she didn't seem like she was lying to us because that's how good of a con artist she was. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it helped her being a female because, uh, I, I would bet money that these law enforcement officers were more male and they were trying to see the good in her, you know, because I, again, if it's like, what's your nickname of your uncle? If the answer is Fred, I don't think she got the answer right saying Fred. I mean, unless she's pulled these, you know, crazy answers out of, out of thin air. Well, and you know, 
if it, m- most people who end up being a police officer or detective, whether you are male or female, you grow up wanting to help others and, and protect others. That's why a lot of those people go into that field. Right. She could have. We already heard the story once of I'm being stalked. I'm moving to uh, the other side of the country and I'm going to go to Harvard to get away from this crazy ex-boyfriend. Um, maybe she played that scared young woman card again to these people that naturally probably want to protect and serve and, and keep her safe and keep others safe by saying, look, I am Brooke Henson and I left there for a good reason. And this is why, and this is why I've not reached out to my family. This is why I've been up here all these miles away for all these years. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Hey, I'm Travis Kelsey, and I'm here to tell you that you can get every touchdown from every game on Sunday afternoons with NFL Red Zone from NFL Network, included in Sports Pack on DirecTV, so you'll never miss a big moment. Hey, we kind of shared a big moment learning about all this great football on DirecTV, didn't we? I know I'll never forget it. Stop compromising. Get DirecTV with or without a satellite when you visit DirecTV.com. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. We are back, Captain, but we have a big problem to deal with. You. We have Brooke Henson, this woman claiming to be Brooke Henson. NYPD speaks with her, and she says, I am her, but she cannot get around. She gets a lot of the uh, questions right that the the family submitted. Mm -hmm. However, she can't get around the fact that she does not look like Brooke Henson. Yeah, that's kind of a problem. Right. So the police are reaching out to the family and they're saying, look, she got a lot of these questions right, but she does not look anything like your missing daughter, your missing loved one. Right. And I think they actually take a picture of her and send it to the family. And then, yeah. And the family is like, well, that doesn't look like her. But again, seven years has passed. So, you you know, I I think they needed to make sure, you know, and and that's so sad to me because... The, this family has their hopes up that maybe she just ran off and started a new life. Well, and so the police are going to tell her that, hey, look, this is all very simple. This is all very easy. All we need you to do is take a DNA test, mm-hmm. and this will prove you are who you say you are, and you can go back to living your life, and, and we will leave you alone. Well, and, they make a mistake here, though. Well, she agrees to take the test. Right. Right. But she, the mistake is they're going to wait, you know, another day. Yeah. We'll take the test in the morning. Well, what happens is she's planning her escape route mm-hmm. as soon as she agrees to this DNA test. And she didn't, this is not going to be like she moves her entire apartment in the middle of the night. I believe she said she took like a change of clothes and her dog 
like like mm-hmm. the the one thing she couldn't live without and she got out of dodge well and she probably bought that dog on credit so yeah somebody else's credit mm-hmm. so she agrees to this test and but what she did that was very interesting here captain when she fled she decided to take her dog and she took her toothbrush her hairbrushes, her combs. She took things that they probably would have used or tested for DNA to see who she w- actually was. Right. When she, when Esther Reed fled New York City, she relocated to Chicago, and there she changed her identity to Jennifer Myers. After she fled, she was placed on the United States Secret Service 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. Now, but now this name that she's going to go with, Jennifer Myers. Mm-hmm. This is actually going to be, I think, the first name that she ever just makes up. All the other people that she was going by before were real people. Real people. With established identities. Um, it, were the other people, were you able to figure out why she chose the other names? Natalie Fisher, Natalie Bowman? No. I I, th- I think some of it was just Google searches. Okay. Were, and these people were alive and well, and she just used their identities. Yeah, well, some of the people she knew, like back uh, back in Seattle, the stuff she got in trouble for, it was the sister of a guy she dated, mm-hmm. and then. But I think a lot of the other people that she were she was using was just missing persons, which is again, it's like that's my issue with this whole thing. You know, it's like I think she thought. That it's not hurting anybody. Right. But it is because these people are possibly victims of a crime. Mm-hmm. You know, these missing people. We we don't know what happened to them. So they could have, you know, been murdered and we just haven't found their bodies. Um, they could be put into some kind of sex trafficking ring. And and so there there are victims. They're they're missing people, but they're missing victims, and you're then victimizing them again. And their families. Right. So the thing here is I I was curious to see how she came up with this. We know she came up with the name for Brooke Henson because she she looked at it up on the Internet and found this girl that was missing that was roughly her same age. Mm -hmm. I had heard some stories and and read some stories over the years that um, some people that wanted to take on a new identity would. This sounds crazy, but they would find somebody that was that had recently passed away. Right. And use their identity. Um, So she has fled New York City and she relocated to Chicago. Now, there's some debate over why she went to Chicago. I guess there is an ex-boyfriend of hers lived there. Um, Mm -hmm. There was some question if if she had contacted him and if he knew her whereabouts and was aiding and abetting her. Um, Yeah. And well, and what's interesting here too, which we haven't really touched upon, we talked about how that she had these boyfriends from West Point, and and boyfriends from basically all over. She had a lot of online relationships going, and there was a actually a graduate from West Point that sent her money, so she was getting. Not only was she taking credit cards and 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 racking up those bills, but she was also getting different guys that she uh, had some kind of online relationship with to send her money. Well, and she never worked, you know, she didn't need to because she's using all these other people's fake credit cards right. and, and you know, they're buying things off of this, the credit cards. And then you get a little stipend with your student loan, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's a good ruse. That's a good identity to uh, steal or thing to fake anyway. But the, the friend's, we're put in a weird situation because they're being interviewed by police and they're going, Hey, how did none of you know this? How did none of you know that she wasn't who she said she was? She didn't have a job. Was there anything that tipped you off? And their response to the job thing was, was look, she lied to us just like she lied to everybody else. Right. She told us that she won these chess tournaments from time to time. And when she won them, it was like these high stakes poker tournaments that we see on TV. There's a large payout and you can live off of a large payout for some time. And I had a good buddy's dad that actually did this. He would go to Vegas and play in these tournaments and the payout wasn't huge, but sometimes it could be 5,000, $10,000. Well, in a, 
if you're a college student, five thousand, ten thousand dollars. That's huge. So, you know, it's also a weird world where it's like it's kind of it's kind of like our job. You know, people people go, uh, um, you know, if somebody said to you, well, "Well, I go play in these chess tournaments," you've never heard of a chess tournament. I mean, you might have heard of one, but you have no clue what the person makes, right? And it's just like if somebody asks you, "Hey, well, what do you do for a living?" And you go, "Ah, podcasts." You know, they have no, you know, it's like you could either make zero dollars or you can make a ton of money. So I think it was a perfect ruse because it's, it's something that people would go, oh, well, I could see how you'd make money, but I don't know anything about it. And they're not going to take the time to do the research to figure that out. I want to question her intentions here, Captain, because I wonder the, the passport thing seems very interesting to me because it seems very risky. And I think Esther Reed is a smart enough individual that she probably wouldn't do something that risky unless she really had a plan. I think she intended to use that passport. I wonder, look, she was two years in to her college Mm -hmm. career, let's say at Columbia university. She's two years into that. I wonder if when she graduated, the plan was to move overseas somewhere. Well, they had uh, a couple of the guys that she was seeing. um, And again, I don't know if this was in person or just online. Some of the guys that she was seeing from West Point that were stationed overseas, like in Germany. Well, what was weird was, so when she went missing and she relocated to Chicago, well, they're going to find all this stuff in our apartment that she left behind. And one of these things that they're going to find is tons of records of instant message um, chat back and forth mm-hmm. with some of these individuals. And it was really strange because, and the reason why she got on uh, the most wanted list, was that the CIA? The Secret Service. Okay. and the But the re, one of the reasons why was because she's having these chats back and forth with these West Point graduates or West Point students. And the questioning, you know, how, how was your day ex, uh, in class? Oh, it was pretty good. What did you guys go over? We went over a uh, strategic, um, you know, war plans or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then she'd be asking, well, is this real? Are these real plans or are these fake plans? You know, and she would, she would almost grill these guys as if she's trying to get some kind of, top secret information from them. Well, and I think in one of the uh, communiques back and forth, she said that (laughs) she said she, I think she even said I'm a spy, like kind of jokingly said I, or I might be a secret agent or special agent, something like that. And then, well, she might be a douche canoe. They have to wonder though, if she isn't Brooke Henson one, who is she Two, Why is she pretending to be Brooke Henson? What, what is she here doing? doing is that is this part of a bigger picture that we're not understanding the other thing that's weird too is you have to wonder and i know law enforcement did and they investigated this but Mm -hmm. you have to wonder did she have something to do with brooke henson's disappearance yeah you know did did she do something to this young woman to take her identity and to assume that identity right so now we have her in chicago And she's going by Jennifer. She went by Jennifer Myers in Chicago. And this case has a big tie into a previous case that we have covered. This is the Lane Bryant case. And you ask, well, how does this tie into the Lane Bryant case? Well, on February 3rd, 2008 in Tinley Park, Illinois, Esther Reed was captured by Tinley Park police who coincidentally were searching the entire area for a gunman who had shot and killed five women at the Lane Bryant store that morning. All right. So how about you dive into that a little more? Okay. So the, the Lane Bryant store, it was, these women were taken hostage Yeah. and the gunman, he, he was robbing the store and he killed the women that he took hostage. Mm -hmm. So police, they find out about this situation very quickly because one of the hostages called 911. This gunman flees. So they are searching the immediate area with, with everybody you can think of. They've called in other law enforcement agencies to help them go through this area and search everything. They're searching stores, restaurants, parking lots, 
You right. name it, they're looking for this guy. They think he probably fled, didn't get very far away, and was just ducking and hiding somewhere. When one of the thoughts was that this individual was possibly from another state. So law enforcement was going around to the different hotels and looking for cars that had license plates from different states. Well, they come across Esther Reed's car. Yes. And then now they got to go, okay, well now we got to figure out who has this car. And so then they question her. Yes. So Esther Reed's car was in a sleep in motel parking lot, <laughs> which is in uh, the area of where this shooting took place. Well, I laugh because that's where we stayed the night before we went to a, a crime con. We stayed in a sleep in. Uh, Esther Reed later said that on that day she had got some lunch and she went back to the room, fell asleep, and she woke up to a knock at her hotel room door. This is federal marshals and the police. They knocked on her door at the sleep in hotel and asked her for her ID. The authorities then noticed that the ID she handed them had been flagged by the secret service. So she was questioned and she was transported to the police station for further questioning where she confirmed her real name was Esther Reed. Mm. So Esther Reed was on the run for two and a half years. This is before being arrested in Chicago or the Tinley park in the greater Chicago area. Right. She was charged with mail and wire fraud, possession of false identity documentation and identity theft. In August, she pled guilty to federal fraud and identity theft charges in February of 2009, she was sentenced to four years in prison. Esther Reed stated that she never meant to harm anyone and only took Henson's identity to rise above a painful past. Authorities believe that she is an opportunist who didn't actually have anything to do with Henson's disappearance. They investigated that for quite some time. I, I saw a news broadcast, a, a, a from that was a year and a half after they had arrested Esther Reed yeah. saying that they were still kind of looking into if there was any possibility that she had anything to do with the disappearance of Brooke Henson. So eventually Esther Reed is extradited to South Carolina where she was tried on four felony charges. She faced, this is where it gets weird. She faced a potential sentence of 47 years 47 years in prison. Yeah. She pled guilty and was sentenced to 51 months in federal prisons. 50. So uh, somehow it went from 47 years to 51 months in prison. And mind you, she went to, um, I don't have the, the real name of this prison, but she went to a prison in West Virginia. Oh, it was the prison using a, uh, fake alias. It was, this prison has been nicknamed, Camp Cupcake. Oh, uh, yeah. I think this is where Martha Stewart served some time. So it's kind of a... That's where uh, I went to elementary school. <laughs> but here's here's the possible tie-in to the Lane Bryant. It, it's it's weird. It's, it's either a huge coincidence that she happened to be in that area or... Let's go down this road for a second here, Captain. Let's think, it, let's think outside the box and, and mm -hmm. think in hypothetical. So because of multiple fraudulent identities... Esther Reed could not risk getting a job earning money the responsible way. Right. That's what got her caught the last time, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, she used, and we know this to be to be fact. Instead, she used her high intelligence and her her mind to forge fake clothing store receipts and used them to return items for more than what they were worth or what she had actually paid for in the first place. Yeah. So what she'd do is she'd go into the store. Let's say the item was a hundred dollars. She would have a, a, you know, um, a coupon for 60% off, 75% off, whatever big, big sale. Mm -hmm. And so she would buy that item and then she would go to a different store and return that item, but basically get full, full price for it. She, she did this a lot. She conned some of the biggest stores in the U S and probably pocketed, thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Now on the day of the murders at Lane Bryant, Lane Bryant was having a sale, a $9.99 cent sale. It would have been a perfect situation for her to buy some brand name clothing mm -hmm. at a low price and then forge the receipts to return them at a different Lane Bryant store later for a profit. Yeah. So and the other weird thing too, captain is shortly after the Lane Bryant killings, 
There was a video that was released to ask people if they could recognize a small black SUV and a black sedan or dark colored sedan. Mm -hmm. After the capture of Esther Reed, the police, this is what's weird. They, then they start only requesting information on the black SUV, not the sedan. Esther Reed owned a dark colored sedan. That's the vehicle that they found in the parking lot at the sleep Inn. it was, I believe either a dark green or dark blue sedan. So it looks similar to the one seen in the lane Bryant parking lot. The other thing that they have to put into play here is that you're talking about an execution mm -hmm. of multiple women, right? Mm -hmm. And when you kind of think of uh, how they came into lane, Bryant took control, um, was Esther Reed in there and did she have somebody, possibly somebody that she was seeing from West Point that would have some kind of knowledge on how to take over a situation and then when things went you know, awry, then they decided to murder, murder these victims? Uh, I, I think it's not crazy to question that. If she was, in fact, the driver of the dark-colored sedan, she never entered the Lane Bryant store. That driver never did. We know that to be fact. However, the dark-colored sedan and the black SUV, which it's believed that the assailant left in the black F SUV, they left the parking lot almost at the exact same time. Right. So here's what you got to question. Was she the lookout man? Was she the brains behind this operation or at the very least there's also a possibility she had no idea that this was going on that there were hostages being taken there was a robbery in progress at the lane bryant store mm -hmm. that she was planning on hitting up for this coupon day for the 999 sale but was she the driver of the dark colored vehicle she stumbles on this crime that's developing mm -hmm. and she hears the sirens this 911 was called Police were en route before the before the assailant left the building. Mm -hmm. Does she hear the sirens and decide that she's going to flee? And what did she see before she fled the scene? Because you have to wonder, how does one get from 47 years, facing 47 years in prison, to only receiving 51 months? And on top of that, she pled guilty to crimes, mm -hmm. but she stated, I'm not going to go into detail about these crimes. She pled guilty to the charges, but she's not going to go into details about what crimes she committed while she was on the run, while she was assuming other people's identities. Well, I also think, I also think there's probably a bunch more charges that they could have charged her with if she would have spoke up about them and said, well, actually, yeah, I did those, but there's a bunch you probably don't know about. And just like you said, how many uh, identities was she stealing at one time? to live one life as somebody else. But to your point, did she see something and did she use that as a bargaining chip um, to lessen her sentence? The crazy thing though here, Captain, it, let's say that is the truth. Let, or at the very least, let's say that she saw something, whether she used it for a bargaining chip or not, I don't know. But let's say she saw something. Esther Reed is, is uh, manipulative. She's very secretive. She enjoys keeping secrets, obviously. She's conned many people over the years, and she's been in many situations where she's proven mm. at least more cunning or smarter than, than some of the people chasing her or okay. around her at the time. I have to wonder if she was there near the Lane Bryant store, didn't have anything to do with the actual crime itself, but saw something. You have to wonder, would she hold back this information. Is there a chance that she didn't tell police something that she knows in case she did need a bargaining chip later? Right. So Esther Reed, as we said, she pled guilty to these charges. She ends up getting 51 months in camp cupcake where she served her time and she was released in October of 2011. Mm -hmm. So she's out. She's a free woman now. However, the Henson family still has no answers as to where their daughter is. They have this woman who stole her identity. She's been missing now for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Esther Reed's story, we're not the first to tell it. But the thing that is a bit, the thing that 
really gets to me, and I know it got to you as well, Captain, is that when people tell the story of Esther Reed of this con woman, they mention that Brooke Henson's identity was stolen, but they don't talk a lot about Brooke Henson. They don't talk about, you know, let's solve her case. You know, this case is solved. This Esther Reed business is done with. Let's solve Brooke Henson's case. And so I thought that that's, we both thought that's why it would be important to give the circumstances of, of her disappearance and some things, notes regarding the investigation itself. The police worked this pretty hard down there in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now Henson's boyfriend, remember we said that she had left him a note. They had some kind of disagreement that night. She left a note. There's a lot of people that speculate that he may have followed her, that he may have went after her and had something to do with their disappearance. As reported, they had a volatile relationship and he and his friend, the boyfriend and his friend reportedly would not cooperate with the investigation into her disappearance. And her boyfriend's name is Sean Shirley. This was the boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, and he reportedly does have a criminal record for some drug-related offenses and assaults. However, he has never been named as a suspect in Brooks' disappearance. It should be noted, however, that many of the people in Henson's life, this would be some of her friends at the time, reportedly were involved in criminal activity, not just the boyfriend. Right. Brooklyn Henson's loved ones stated that it is extremely uncharacteristic of her to leave without any type of warning. Her family said that authorities did not begin a search of the area until three weeks after her disappearance. Investigators reportedly believed that Henson left on her own accord and expected her to return shortly afterwards. But obviously now they suspect foul play. Her family describes her as a fun loving woman who enjoyed hiking and being outdoors. She did drop out of high school in the 10th grade. That would be why Esther Reed had to get the GED before going off to college. But investigators believe that Henson was most likely murdered, sadly. And they have a suspect in her disappearance, but there has never been enough evidence to charge this individual. The loved ones of Brooke Lee Henson have lived for over 18 years, a nightmare. Now, there are so many families out there that have lived without their loved one more years than they did with them. And unless Brooke is brought home soon, her family will tragically join that group. All it takes to close a missing persons case and bring someone home is a tip. Only the public can bring tips and leads to the investigators. Someone or someones may know something about Brooke where she is or what happened to her. And even a small tip can make a huge difference. If you have any information at all about Brooke Lee Henson, please contact the Travelers Rest Police Department at 864-23-CRIME, or you can contact the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division at 803-737-9000. And I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday weekend. I had a fantastic time. Me and the captain hung out a little bit. God bless our soldiers. God bless all of our veterans. And only one show this week, Captain, because of Mm -hmm. the holiday week. But if you need a little more TCG, Mm -hmm. guess what you do? You get Stitcher Premium because this week we released our fifth episode on Stitcher Premium of Off the Record. And you can check that out. It came out last night. We did an hour and a half show of off the record. Yeah, it's an hour and a half conversation we did at the Columbus Podcast Festival. We talked a lot about the Brian Schaefer case and how we got started with the whole podcast thing. So if you're interested in that, check out stitcherpremium.com slash true crime garage. And until next week, everybody be good, be kind, and don't let them.
Hey, I'm Travis Kelsey, and I'm here to tell you that you can get every touchdown from every game on Sunday afternoons with NFL Red Zone from NFL Network, included in Sports Pack on DirecTV, so you'll never miss a big moment. Hey, we kind of shared a big moment learning about all this great football on DirecTV, didn't we? I know I'll never forget it. Stop compromising. Get DirecTV with or without a satellite when you visit DirecTV.com. 